In this video, I'm going to try to explain how SSD storage works, in simple terms so that we can all understand. So if you've got a computer with an SSD and you want to learn more, hopefully you'll find this video useful. But I'm also approaching this to try and help Apple M1 owners get a little bit of peace of mind. There's been a fair bit of negative press surrounding the high data rights on the M1 Max, and some M1 users are worried about the lifespan of their SSD. I've made a few videos about this, and each time I try to reassure M1 owners that they probably don't have anything to worry about. Uh, but this doesn't seem to stop the deluge of comments from worried M1 owners. So if that's you, please watch the video all the way through if you can. You might find it helpful. SSDs make use of something called NAND flash, named after the NOT AND logic gate. And this is a type of non-volatile flash memory. By that, we mean you can store information and it will remain stored even if you switch the power off. Let's use an analogy to help us understand the processes involved. I'd like you to imagine a warehouse full of small storage units. And each unit can have something in it, or it can be empty. And let's say that if the unit has something inside, the door will be shut, and otherwise it will be open. We don't care what's in the storage unit, we're just interested in whether it's in use or empty, off or on, one or zero, just like a computer uses ones and zeros to store information. Computers do this with switches called transistors, and there are millions of them in your computer's processor and memory. When you power down the computer, the state of these switches is lost, and so is the data. But that doesn't happen with your SSD, and that's because it's using a type of switch called a floating gate transistor. And essentially, these gates, they trap electrons, and this effect continues when the system is powered off. To read the data that's stored, a small voltage is applied to the circuit, and it's possible to determine the state of an individual cell. Does it have electrons trapped or not? And in our analogy, this is a bit like putting something into the storage unit and shutting the door. The reading process is efficient and very fast. Much like in our storage center, we could look and quickly see which storage units have the door open or shut. But the writing process is rather slower, and it's also destructive in nature. Each time you write data to a cell, it degrades slightly. In SSD terms, we call this a PE, or Program Erase Cycle, since the SSD controller has to erase the cell before it can be written to again. Once more, using our analogy, this might be likened to the door of the storage unit wearing out the more that you open and close it. The actual number of writes that are possible depends on the type of NAND flash that's being used. And there are currently four types. First, we have SLC, or single level cells, that can store one bit of data per cell. So that means a one or a zero. And this type of NAND cell has the longest lifespan, with typically each cell being capable of something like 100,000 PE cycles. MLC, or multi-level cells, can store two bits of data per cell, so that's two sets of one or zero. And as we increase the density of each cell, we find that the lifespan drops quite considerably. You'd expect MLC to have a lifespan in the region of 10,000 PE cycles. Next, we've got TLC, or triple level cells, and these can store three bits of data per cell. And again, because we've doubled the density, we've reduced the lifespan. We're now looking at about 3,000 PE cycles. And finally, we've got QLC, or quad level cells, which can store, you guessed it, four bits of data per cell. Lots of density means huge data capacities but we've paid a price on reliability, which is now at just 1,000 PE cycles. So as we increase the density of bits per cell, it means that we're using fewer of those electrons to determine each state, and that makes the process more difficult and slower. As those cells get used, the oxide layers that trap electrons on those floating gates, they wear out. Electrons might end up getting trapped where they shouldn't be, and that affects the electrical state of the cell and makes it less usable. But it's also possible that electrons might leak from the floating gate. Not so much of a problem with SLC because there are only two states per cell, but you can see how that might become a much bigger problem with TLC and QLC. Of course, as we shrink the size of the cell to get ever more storage capacity into the same space, those oxide layers inevitably have to become thinner, and that in turn means that they will wear out faster. So, the lower the density of cells, the lower the storage capacity for a given area of silicon. 
and there's a significantly higher cost. But the upside is that you get very fast performance and incredibly long lifespans. Unfortunately, you're not likely to find SLC NAND flash in your average Mac or PC. Most consumer drives on sale today will be TLC or QLC NAND flash. Much higher densities mean that high capacity storage can be made available at a more consumer friendly price point. And since the average consumer won't be writing the same amounts of data on their personal computer as, say, one of Google's busiest servers, it's probably less of an issue. So you might think, why would anyone use QLC? But actually, QLC drives are ideal for storing data that doesn't frequently change, because you can have a huge capacity for a reasonable price, and still enjoy those super fast SSD read speeds. In fact, some cheaper computers may even have QLC drives as their main system drive. But really, TLC is much better suited to that purpose, where data is being written and modified more frequently. And this is almost certainly the type of NAND flash being used in Apple's M1 Max, but it may not be the only type. Now hopefully you're still with me, but there are some more things about SSD behavior that it's useful to know. Data is written to the SSD in units called pages, and each page is made up of lots of cells. Typically, data is written in page sizes of four kilobytes. So depending on the type of cells being used, that's gonna be somewhere between four and 32,000, if my math is correct. Um, however, those cells can only be erased in larger units called blocks, and a block is 256 kilobytes or 64 pages. So we write in small pages, but we delete in large blocks. A diagram might be helpful. Here we've got two blocks, each with 64 pages. Now let's suppose that we've got a file that uses 16 pages in the first block. Then we write another file, which takes up another 32 pages. And now we want to edit that original file. Remember, cells can only be programmed after they've been erased. And in order to erase it, we need to delete the entire block. So if we want to modify this file, uh, we first have to copy it into some of these free pages. So now we've filled up our block. But the first 16 pages are wasted space. And if we want to make any further modifications, we'll need to move all of the good pages to a new block and then we can erase this first block to make it available again. And this last step is something called garbage collection, which goes on in the background. And all of this shuffling of data means that when you write data to your SSD, the actual amount of data that gets written to the NAND cells can be more than you expected. You might save a one megabyte file, but the amount of data written could be higher than that, maybe two megabytes. And this is referred to as write amplification, or WA. And naturally, SSD manufacturers are working very hard to find clever solutions to these issues. Here though, it helps us to just sidetrack for a moment to understand how things used to work with spinning hard disks. A traditional hard disk has spinning metal plates and then a head which magnetizes tiny areas of the disk to store those ones and zeros. And that storage is permanent until it's erased or overwritten. When you delete a file from the disk it doesn't actually erase the data that makes up the file, it simply deletes the file pointer. Or in other words, the little bit of information that tells the hard disk controller where the data for that file actually physically is on the disk. So whilst you can't access the file anymore, the physical magnetized data still exists on the disk until it is overwritten by a new file. And this is why it's possible to take an old hard disk and scan it and recover deleted files. And it's also why you should always do a full format where all data is erased before you sell a computer with a spinning hard disk in it. Now, why do we need to know this? Well, simply because the hard disk and the SSD are fundamentally different here. With the hard disk, once the file pointer is deleted, the area on the disk where the data is stored becomes available to be written to. And the hard disk can do this without first having to delete that data. And because of this, there was never a need for the operating system to tell the hard disk controller which actual blocks of data need to be deleted. And this behavior continued with the introduction of SSDs, but obviously it doesn't work very well with SSDs. So it was fixed with something called trim. And this is a command that allows the operating system to tell the SSD controller which blocks can actually be deleted. All modern operating systems support trim, but macOS doesn't switch it on by default for third-party drives, and this has caused some confusion for some users. Uh, to be clear, if your Mac comes with an SSD, trim is enabled for that SSD, 
and this obviously applies to all of the M1 machines. Uh, so hopefully you've been able to see that SSDs have some very clear advantages, along with some disadvantages. But you shouldn't assume that your SSD is fragile or that it's just waiting to fail. They are proven to be far more reliable than spinning hard disks when it comes to early failure rates. And manufacturers have got some clever workarounds for those downsides. Let's consider a few. Uh, first of all, the slower performance of the more dense cell types like TLC can be overcome by implementing memory cache. This is known as DRAM cache memory. Data can be written to this memory very quickly, and then in the background, the SSD can flush it out to the NAND cells. Likewise, frequently accessed data can be temporarily cached to speed up read performance. Another thing you could do is combine different cell types. So you might have a small area of frequently used lower density cells that have a much higher endurance. Um, but it's also possible to use a dense cell to emulate a less dense cell. For example, there's something known as pseudo SLC, where MLC or TLC can be used to emulate the storage states of SLC NAND. And the use of these fewer storage states means a hugely increased endurance per cell, without the increased cost of building your SSD from SLC. Now, some or all of the drive could be used in this way, and I guess it would be possible with the right SSD controller to dynamically change the use of cells. Another simple way that manufacturers improve the lifespan of the SSD is through over-provisioning. In other words, they provide more cells than the advertised capacity of the SSD would require. These spare cells can take over as other cells wear out, thus extending the life of the SSD. So all of these clever solutions and more besides combine to make SSDs an excellent choice for the vast majority of computing tasks. Let's now just focus on the Apple SSD issues that have been hitting the news. We've seen that the new M1 computers appear to be writing a lot more data to the SSD than Intel models. I've reported on this on the channel, as I said at the outset, and each time I try to reassure everyone. But if you're still worried about the lifespan of your M1 SSD, here's a couple of points to bear in mind. Firstly, we don't know the exact composition of the SSD in the M1. We don't know which of these techniques Apple is using, uh, but in all likelihood, Apple uses all of them. And secondly, Apple was one of the first adopters of SSD technology in mainstream and mobile computing, and they have some pretty fantastic engineers on board. Way back in 2011, they acquired a company based in Israel called Anobit in a $400 million deal. Anobit designs controller chips for SSDs that specifically address all of the issues that we've been talking about. Reliability, endurance, and performance. Uh, they're very good at it, and they've got a large number of patents in this field. The acquisition added more than 100 world-class SSD engineers to Apple's team. So given these facts, do we imagine that Apple's SSD engineers haven't fully tested the M1 implementation? Especially given that Apple has been working on this for many years. I don't think it makes sense to conclude that. Now don't misunderstand me, there certainly are apps that cause an abnormal amount of data writes on these M1 computers, as reported by software tools that are reading the smart data from the drive. But those software tools are only giving us the total amount of data written, as recorded by the drive. It doesn't necessarily show us how that data has been apportioned via the various technologies that we discussed. So these issues are a concern, and I'm sure that there are a very small percentage of users who may have issues to take up with Apple support. However, I do believe that the vast majority of users probably don't need to worry. I suspect the lifespan of these SSDs is far greater than most people expect, and it's entirely likely that the reporting tools we're using are not giving us the complete picture. Each time I've made a video on this subject, I've tried to provide some reasoned, logical, and unbiased information. Um, but that doesn't stop people in the comments section suggesting that I am defending or supporting Apple in some way. Uh, and that's really not the case. I think Apple's decision to solder the SSD components onto the logic board doesn't make any sense from a consumer perspective, and I understand why people are upset about it. I think there are a number of reasons why Apple may have done this. Uh, I can think of three. And the first is the obvious one, that it's a commercial reason. Although I don't think it's quite what some people think. I don't believe that Apple are trying to get you to ditch your computer and buy a new one. Over the last 20 years, I've bought and sold a large number of Apple Macs for both personal and business use. And what I've found is that those machines last a long time. Generally, they're reliable. That's not to say that we don't have issues, we do. Although, I've never had an SSD issue, and we're talking about probably more than 100 computers here. 
I think there is a commercial motivation, but I think it's more to do with specking the computer at point of sale. Because Apple wants you to buy a bigger SSD and they charge a huge markup on those things. So your computer adds up in price very quickly if you start upgrading components. The second reason may be to do with space constraints. Uh, because it takes more room to have a socketed SSD on the logic board. Now, of course, I imagine lots of people say, but hang on, there's loads of room in the current M1 computer chassis. Bear in mind though, those chassis are just repurposed Intel chassis. In the future, Apple is probably going to design different chassis for its M1 Max, and maybe the space constraints are a bigger concern there. Perhaps we'll see thinner designs or designs of laptops where more space is taken up by the battery to give a longer battery life. Uh, the third reason is that Apple has probably got some sort of proprietary SSD controllers being used and proprietary firmware. So it may well be the case that you couldn't just take an off-the-shelf NVMe drive and slot it in. Whatever the reasons are behind this decision, soldering an SSD to the logic board doesn't make sense for most consumers. Uh, why would you want to have that in a part that you know is destined to fail at some point? Of course, you can argue that the majority of consumers would never use their SSD to the extent of its lifespan. In fact, it's probably more likely that other components on the computer would fail before the SSD did. But there are certain groups of users who do write enormous amounts of data to the SSD. And if that's you, then that basically takes the M1 Max off the table for consideration. Uh, and if you're a long-time Mac user, then I can understand that that's pretty frustrating. But in which case, I'd just say, why not just hang on and see what Apple bring out next for the pro community? Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you found this useful, informative, and or entertaining in some way. And if so, please consider supporting the channel with just one click of that subscribe button. Maybe my efforts today have been enough to earn a thumbs up from you, or a thumbs down if that's how you feel. But in any case, I hope to see you again soon for some more geekery.